comes her way, it's not from him. <laughs> that you're awesome. We thank you that you're a good God. We just invite your presence into this place. God, we know you're with us every second of the day, but Lord, when we gather together, you come in a special way, and so I'm asking today that you would move in our midst. I'm asking that, Lord, you would even move over the internet. It's so great that, that you're so everywhere, so obviously you can touch people who, who are hundreds of miles or thousands of miles, even side of the earth. So Lord, we just pray that today your presence will manifest and as we're gathered together your glory would be made known. So thank you for your kindness, your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love for us. 
good news. Wahoo! We made it through that one. <laughs> well, you know what I said during practice? I said, I hope my throat doesn't blow out. Because that gets hot. <laughs> Woo! I love it. saving knowledge of Christ can attest to the fact that God has done miracles in our hearts and our minds and our bodies just in every way and some of you are already here when I said today is um, Terry and, and our 45th anniversary yes I am that old <laughs> 45 years that we've been married um, we were pretty young when we got married 18 and 19 that's pretty darn young and I don't recommend it, but <laughs> a little more maturity on you is always helpful. <laughs> but, 
<laughs> but, you know, our marriage is a, an attest, testament to a miracle working God. Because, um, yeah, he had, he had some stuff to work with. <laughs> but, but here we are 45 years later and we still like each other a whole lot. <laughs> so that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We like being together. Well, I do know when we first got married, I was a jerk. And now I'm mostly not a jerk. <laughs> I have to say that because we Living all very have thankful our days, for that. don't we? <laughs> yes. But God is our deliverer. He just did such yes. good work. And, and he's always working on us. And so it's it awesome. Is. Yeah, because the, the goal is to be like Christ, right? And to know what that is like. And I tell you, marriage will help you. <laughs> <laughs> you get married and you will have to make some decisions whether you're going to be like Christ or not. <laughs> Anybody who's been married, you understand that. <laughs> but it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Well, iron sharpens iron, right? Iron sharpens iron. <laughs> so, praise God. Slow down, take time. Breathe in. Your promise to be there. 
So, um, like when you think the words of this song, slow down, take time, breathe in, he said, he'll reveal what's to come. In other words, God's going to show us what's to come. He's done it in his word, and he'll even show us for our own personal life. It says the thoughts of his mind, always higher than mine, he'll reveal what's to come. God wants to give us hope. He's a God of hope. He's a God of promises. And it says, uh, the third verse says, sing praise, my soul. Find strength in joy. Let his words lead you on. And the scripture says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And when he speaks to us, I was thinking about this the other day, and I have no idea why, because you know how things pop in your mind from I think I was talking to a friend is what brought it up. And uh, I was saying that when God called us to come to North Dakota, because he asked, why in the world are you in North Dakota? Because a lot of people ask that question. And it's because God led us here, and he wanted us to be in this place, in this city, for this time. And so he led us here, and I said, you know, the thing that I knew is that when God called, what he did was... um, I was in Bible college. We were getting ready to uh, graduate and wanted to go and and start a church from scratch. And so uh, we found out that our district that I was in in the Northwest, because we were in uh, Eugene, Oregon, so what they did is they they said, we just got North Dakota and for part of our district. And so I just said, that's interesting. I want to go to North Dakota. And I thought, isn't that weird? But I said, I want to go to North Dakota. I'm from Minnesota, so it's not that crazy. But uh, when you're in the West Coast, they think you're crazy if you want to go to the Midwest and freeze and, you know, and stuff like that. And so then I just, I said, no, I want to go there. And so I, I talked to the supervisor and he said, there's 13 different places that we could go and they read off this list and when it read Grand Forks, something just leapt inside of me. I thought, that's interesting. So, you know, like Mary pondered. <laughs> I just said, hmm, that's interesting. And so then I told, called Suzette because I was working and I had called to get this list, you know, of places. And I says, don't say anything, don't say a word. I said, we're gonna fast and pray for a week but I'm gonna give you this list. And so I did that and Suzette said the same thing happened to her when Grand Forks popped up in in that list, something leapt within her. And so when I know the voice of the Lord, when I know that God wants it, so we prayed for a week and I said Grand Forks, she said Grand Forks. And so then we looked up where Grand Forks was because we didn't even know where it was. We did, literally did not, we knew it was in North Dakota, obviously, but I didn't know if it was in the west, east, north, south, wherever it was. So we looked it up on the map, and, uh, and then I said, we're going to go to Grand Forks. And the funny thing about that is that our supervisor that we had, our district superintendent that's directly over us as far as oversight and stuff, he said three times, don't go to Grand Forks. He says, don't go there. He called me on the phone and said, don't go there. I said, no, I said, I have to go there or I don't go anywhere because I'm not, I'm not going anywhere but Grand Forks. So he said, okay, second time he said, okay. And so then the third time we're, we have our U-Haul loaded to the max. We had just driven from Eugene, Oregon to Billings, Montana, we walk into the office and he says, I don't want you to go to Grand Forks. And I said this every time, I didn't say this, but I said, sir, I don't mean to be rude or anything, but either I go to Grand Forks or I don't go anywhere. So I said, okay. And then when we got here, obviously there's difficult times. There's difficult times and seasons we've gone through in ministry. We've asked ourselves, should we even be here? We've said in our minds, let's go, let's leave. But here's the whole thing that's so important and vital. When you know the word that the Lord has spoken to you, you can be immovable. 
you can say, oh, let's go. I want to go away. I want to go something different. I want to get out of here. I want something new. But you go back to the word that God has spoken, and it gives you stability in the times of difficulty, the times of disappointment, the times of woundedness, whatever is taking place. We say yes to the Lord because he's spoken. And that's kind of what this is saying. He leads us. He guides us. He speaks to us. Do not forget his faithfulness. He'll complete. He'll finish all that he's begun. And so there's something of knowing what God has spoken to your heart that will absolutely seal it for you. That no matter what comes, you're going to stand. Amen. You may think, run, but you're going to stand. Mm -hmm. You may wish to be somewhere else, but you're going to stand. Because he's spoken his word. Amen. And then it says, take courage. Take courage. Yeah, that was 35 years ago. Well, it'll be 36 in August, yeah. so 35 and a half. So we're counting. Yeah. Yeah. I count halves, isn't it? Like kids, how old are you? Eight and a half. They, they never just say eight. I'm eight and a half. I'm nine and a half because they want to be to the next age. Well... <laughs> There's scriptures that validate this next song also. Just as all who are thirsty, all who are weak, come to the fountain, so to come to the Lord.
just thank you for your presence. The beauty of who you are, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, it just takes me a moment to switch over from being worship leader man to preacher man. i got to get my little preacher thing on here because, man, I want to do that. God's incredibly faithful, and we can count on every promise that he's spoken to us, every promise he will keep. He'll keep his end of the bargain. Now, he calls us into a covenant, which means we have parts that we need to keep in order to be in that right relationship with him, and that's a, that's a wonderful thing. We're, we're joined together with him in a covenant, which he established, called the new covenant, that gives us opportunity to be in right relationship with him through the blood of Jesus and through all the sacrifice that he's done. And so God's good, and he will keep his promises so as they say you can take that to the bank you can count on him he's faithful so I just wanted to mention something uh, today and just thank a couple people and you know we have a lot of people that do things here we've got like uh, people doing sound different ones doing worship you know Josh is at work today that's why he's not here and and uh, Lena and Faith and Trin in the back, everybody that does things around here. We've got folks that are working downstairs, like, uh, 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 let's see who's down there, um, Gail and Jean Marie and Savannah. And then, you know, we just, Suzette's working with the youth, doing all those things, and it's just important that that we're grateful for them and thank them for that. So this morning I wanted to kind of highlight a couple of, of men who have been ushering for years, Mr. Fred Sl Slominski and Jerry Roosevelt. I should have said Jerry's name first because he comes Roosevelt's before Slominski, but because you got to always say that so that why'd they say me first, you know, yeah, that silly stuff. But uh, I do want to thank you guys for your faithfulness, and, and they've been doing this for years. It's just hilarious. They're just faithful. They are faithful, and something I don't have to worry about. Uh, they just take care of business and, and get it all under control, so I'm very grateful for that. and just want to say thank you, and thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Fred, and, and just honor them for what they do in their service that they serve the Lord with. That's not the only way they do it, but it's one of the ways. And uh, that makes it good for everyone. Um, so this morning we want to just continue worshiping the Lord with our giving. And so, Lord, we just thank you for this time. We thank you that you've called us to be a faithful people in giving. And, Lord, you ask us to give of tithes and offerings and uh, alms, all the different things that that you call us to do. And so I just want to thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to give in Jesus' name. All 
All right. Well, as I said, God is good. And so I'm just wondering, I just, uh, well, thank you, Lord. So, God, I'm, I'm asking that even today what you do is miracles. Lord, there's people within my voice that need to be touched in areas of their lives, either physically, mentally, emotionally, Lord. And so I ask that as we go through the scripture, as we go through your word, that you would be exalted and that your healing virtue would flow. I just think of the apostles in Acts chapter 4 when they said that give them boldness to speak the word and that you would stretch forth your hands in signs and wonders and miracles. And so we invite your presence to come and do that, Lord. When we need a touch, it's not being audacious for us to ask to be healed because you've proven it through your own actions that you're the healer through your own words that you have spoken, through the promises that you have given. And so, Lord, we're just asking in the name of Jesus for the power of your Holy Spirit to manifest in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I was thinking about uh, today's songs. I was going to start with one called Another in the Fire. And Lena, could you turn the volume down just a little on my mic? Because it's kind of hot. And if I talk a little louder, it's going to get crazy. Uh, like 22 or 3 or something. Look at the top. It'll say, Mike, you know. It says it on the top, 22 or 23, somewhere. You not see it? Hello. Yep, I think so. Very good. Thank you. I was thinking of today's song. I was going gonna, I was gonna to sing Another in the Fire as the first song, but it's challenging for me, and so I didn't do it. <clears throat> um, but... That talks, remember that, that story where they took King Nebuchadnezzar made this huge idol and put it in, filled it with fire and said, either you offer incense to me as a god or we're going to throw you in this thing. And so three of the Israelites said, no, won't do it. And so they got cast into the fire and they were going to, he was going to kill them. But then he looked and saw a fourth person in the fire. And so we know who that is. That's God in, the, in coming to their rescue in, I believe it's Jesus, a manifestation of Jesus before he came to earth. But the thing is that the, that the whole thing about that song and that story is that God is with us in the midst of our trials. There's, God is with us in the midst of our trials, and for us to remember that, there's another in the fire. And then we talked about um, stand in your love when things get tough, that God sustains us, that he helps us, he gives us strength, he, he um, takes courage. And yeah, that, both of those songs, because take courage is, is one that's down the line here, then we sang, you came, when death enters our life, God can come and bring resurrection life. Now, I'm not just talking about physical death, that Jesus is going to resurrect everyone. Uh, well, we're here on the earth, you know, like we're going to, everyone's going to pray, and if we die, we'll get resurrected. There is a resurrection that's coming when we'll have a new body. That's when, his, when he returns and stuff. But this idea of him coming and bringing life to 
uh, Lazarus, it gives us hope that God can work in us and he can bring resurrection life into our lives. And then we t said, take courage, uh, my heart, stay steadfast, my soul, it's in the waiting, that we're to fix our eyes on Jesus and press forward into um, our healing, our, our freedom, or the life that God has spoken over us and given us. And then all who are thirsty, all who are weak, that we can come, that we can come to him. And the scriptures, there's multiple scriptures that go around this idea of us being weak. He says, my, my yoke is easy. And so he calls us to himself, and then he strengthens us. He gives us power. He gives us authority. He gives us the strength that we need. But we're going to look at a passage of scripture that talks about uh, the overarching ministry of Jesus and when I speak about his ministry, he's called us to do the same ministry because later on, so when I'm speaking about him, I'm speaking about us too because he's called us. He says, just as the Father has sent me, I send you. He says, greater works than, than these shall you do because I go to the Father. He's telling us he's doing all these incredible signs and wonders and then he's speaking to us and telling us that we're to be involved in those things. And so there's uh, a passage that speaks about this is in Luke chapter 4. It's a classic, classic scripture that um, I've used over and over again because it just speaks of why did Jesus come? What, what did he come to do? Now we know he, he came to seek and save the lost. We know that he came to give his life as a ransom for many. We know that he came to die upon the cross so that we can have a hope for restoration with God and all those things. So we know that those things took place. But when he was talking about his ministry on earth, what, what was he doing? What was he coming uh, to do while he was alive before he went to the cross? What was his purpose? So if we look at uh, Luke 4, verse 14, we're going to start there. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. If you remember right, in the first part of this, uh, this chapter, Jesus was baptized in water. And so what happened is that, that when he was baptized in water, the first thing the Holy Spirit did is send him out into the wilderness to confront the devil. You know, a lot of people give the devil way more credit than he needs. Like the devil was chasing Jesus down and he was coming after him and he was doing all these things. No, the Holy Spirit drove him into the, it's the word it actually uses, drove him into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to be tempted by the devil. He was, he was going um, not... He was not like being defensive. He was being offensive. He was pressing in and he was taking it to the enemy and saying, do your best. Do whatever you think you can do to stop me from fulfilling my purpose and plan that, that God has for my life and what he's called me to do. And so the enemy was confronted and it says that Jesus went into the, the wilderness by the direction of the Spirit, and then when he came out, and this is that verse 14, he came out in the power of the Spirit. When he overcame those things of the enemy, overcame every temptation that was thrown at him over the, that 40-day period, you know, we only see three of them. We only see three in the Scripture, but it says he was being tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. And so then it says... He came out in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the surrounding region. He began teaching in their synagogues, and he was praised by all. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath. He stood up to read, and the scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him, and he unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is Because 
because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all the people in the synagogue were intently directed at him. Now he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I want to highlight some words that I think are important in here because these are the words that he said he came to do. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to what? To bring good news. So he's proclaiming the kingdom of God. He's proclaiming salvation. So he's also to proclaim release to the captives. So he's coming to speak release, freedom, liberty. And then it says recovery of sight. So he's come to to give recovery of sight to the blind and to set free, set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then he said something very interesting. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled. And so Jesus was saying, he went, he was tempted, he came out, and he began his ministry. And as he began his ministry, he says, today this is fulfilled. I've got the power of the Holy Spirit on me. I've been anointed, and I am beginning this process. And and so... According to Luke, there's, there's five major things, five major areas of ministry that Jesus is doing. And so we have to um, think about these, and like I said, um, that they apply to us because we're, we're to do the same thing. We're to bring good news to people. We're to proclaim release to the captives. We're to say recovery of sight to the blind, set free those who are oppressed, and proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And so that's that's what I'm going to even start. I'm going to do it today because as I'm preaching this, I'm I'm going to proclaim just exactly what's what's happening and what's taking place. So he says, "Bring good news to the poor." And what he's talking about the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom of God, the gospel of salvation, the gospel that is the. Uh, some people call it the full gospel, the fullness of the gospel. So what happens in so many people um, that when you use the word salvation, what usually happens is the thought of just coming to Christ and getting saved, coming to Christ and responding to him as Lord. And so it's, it's focused on a spiritual thing that takes place. So so the good news is much broader than that. The kingdom of God is much broader than that. See, when Jesus came to save us, and you can we can verify this in the scripture as we go through and look at the different scriptures. When Jesus came to save us, salvation means salvation from sin, salvation or deliverance from Satan, salvation or healing of sickness, salvation of our brokenness he came to save us from our brokenness he came to reconcile us to god that's the you know the negative one is to get us free from sin the positive one is to reconcile us with god and so he's come to to not only reconcile us with god but make us overcomers overcoming sin overcoming the satan it says that he's given us power and authority over all the works of the enemy he says that we can be healed from all of our diseases and he can heal our broken hearts he can bring peace to our lives and experience that we can experience life more abundantly because that's what he said i came that you may have life and that might be a life more abundant and so his salvation is as broad as our life is in areas where we have anything of oppression, anything of, of sickness or disease or any of those kind of things. I think we need to stand up and contend for the things that Jesus has says he has come to do and that we minister the very same thing that he ministered. And we see that so very clear. 
So he's bringing the good news to the poor. He's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom that that life is available. Salvation is available to people. And it's and again, it's not just a spiritual salvation. It's a physical salvation also, an emotional salvation and those kind of things. So he came to bring that good news. The second thing is he came to proclaim release to the captives. Proclaim release to the captives. Um, well, this is talking about bondage in any form or any shape. Release to the captives. I think Jesus wasn't just going to every prison that they had in Israel going, you're free, come on out. But he's talking about bondages that people have that where they are bound. And it says this idea of captives, the word itself means to be held captive at spear point. So it's, it's talking about a prisoner of war. It's not talking about someone in, in like a jail or a prison that's done something wrong and done something terrible and needs to be arrested and put into prison. This is setting the captives free as those who have been taken by force and have been won over by uh, one with a stronger strength than, than they. And so, so these guys, he's, I think he's talking about being a prisoner of Satan and in spiritual, spiritual bondage. And so what is, does he say? He says he's come to speak release and liberty and freedom. That's that word release means you're free to go. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to show you this video about uh, a man that was in one of the concentration camps in, uh, but I don't have it with me at the moment, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. It's just like a three minute video. And he was talking about the day they got liberated, the day they got set free from, from, the concentration camp. And he said that him and three of his buddies, because they were young, younger kids, three of his buddies, what they would do is they would get out of the barracks as quickly as they possibly could because he said there was so much crying and weeping and screaming and people were praying and, and crying out and just weeping because of their hopelessness and their despair. He said what we would do is we'd get up real early and we would go out. And he says we went out and we looked up and things were different because there wasn't a guard in the guard towers. There wasn't one there. So we said, well, let's get a little brave. After a little while, they decided to go towards the front gate. And they went towards the front gate and there was no soldiers there. But there was a huge padlock. And so they, they still didn't know what was going on, and it was real nice and foggy that day, they said, he said, and they were trying to figure out what was happening, and all of a sudden they saw, they saw a man on a horse come up, and this guy said, I'm, I'm an advanced party, he says, he says, the war is over, you're free, you've been liberated. And he said the guy took his gun, shot the padlock, took it off, and opened up the doors. And he said, <laughs> he said, they ran through the camp to every building saying, we're free, we're free, we're free. They said, we said, we, they said, I, I said it in every language I knew because they had so many people from all over Europe in different languages. They, they were just calling out, we're free, we're free, we're free. And they said the ones that were strong enough would come out and look and they would rejoice. And then the ones that were sick and weren't able to come out and all those kind of things, they weren't able to do that. But he says he went and he said, you know, the, the Germans must have been in such a hurry that they just left everything. He said, I went in to where the guards lived and I went in there and he said, he said there was food in the cupboards. He said there was soap, shampoo. He says there was hot running water. He said he took off his prisoner outfit and he danced a dance on top of it. And he took a hot shower. 
And then he came out, and he said for the first two months he had nightmares. He'd wake up thinking he was still in the concentration camp, but he was free. He was free. And this is what we're talking about, is that Jesus comes to deliver us from those who hold us in, in bondage. And it says that sin holds us in bondage and Satan holds us in bondage if we don't know Jesus. And if we have bondages in our life, it doesn't come from the Lord. It comes from the enemy. And it comes from choices and decisions we've made. But here's, here's the thing. Proclaim release. And that's what those kids did. All three of them running through the camp. We're free. We're free. We're free. We're free. And many came out and just began to walk, but they needed some healing. They needed healing also. So just being set free from bondage doesn't mean that, that we need not be healed. We not, some things need to be healed in our hearts, in our minds, in our emotions, all the different things that take place. So the third thing Jesus talks about, the Holy Spirit has anointed me for the recovery of sight to the blind. And I'm going to say this, you know, it's not just a spiritual thing. He, he literally healed the eyes of the blind. And so here's, here's what we're talking about. Remember John the Baptist? John the Baptist came and he was proclaiming that that. There was one coming who he is not even worthy to untie his shoelaces. He said, the Messiah is coming. He's the one. I'm just proclaiming. I'm declaring him. And so Jesus comes and he said, you know, he baptizes Jesus in the water. And it says that, that God told him that the Holy Spirit would come upon him, descend and remain. And he says, the one who the Holy Spirit does that to, this is the one. And so then he proclaimed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of Israel, that he was, he was uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so he's proclaiming this and he's saying this. And then something crazy happens. He gets arrested. Now, when you get arrested, you, you kind of wonder what's happening. He's proclaiming this Messiah. And in the mind of the people, the Messiah was going to come, wipe Rome out, bring everything back to the way it would be where Israel would be totally free and, and set free. And so now he's in prison and he's not getting out. And so he, he sends his disciples and asks Jesus if he's the one. And so that comes out of Matthew chapter 11, verses two through six, says this. Now, while in prison, John heard about the works of Christ. And he sent word by his disciples, and he said to him, are you the coming one, or are we to look for someone else? And Jesus answered and said to them, you go and report to John what you hear and see. Those who are blind receive sight. He's talking about physical healing. And those who limp walk. Those with leprosy are cleansed. And those who are deaf hear. The dead are raised. The poor have had the gospel preached to them. Then he says, blessed is the person who does not take offense at me. So John was just wondering, Lord, why am I in this situation? Why am I in this bad circumstance if you're, you're the Messiah, if you're the coming one, if you're what we're looking for? And he says, I'm doing what God has anointed me to do. I'm doing what the word has said. Because if you remember, Jesus was reading the scroll of Isaiah. And Isaiah talks about the suffering servant. That's what we call it nowadays is the suffering servant songs. There's ones where it talks about how he heals our diseases and frees us from sin, and he bore it upon himself. There's ones that talk about how the Lord's giving him wisdom and knowledge and speaking all these things. And so, so this idea of recovery of sight for the blind is healing, is that 
that's one of the things that Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit to do. And we see it, I think there's uh, 35 miracles that Jesus has, has listed throughout Scripture that shows him healing the sick and, and, and uh, casting out demons and bringing people to wholeness and salvation. So this is wonderful, and what he's talking about is healing. And then it says to set free those who are oppressed. To set free those who are oppressed. Here's, here's what this word means, to cause serious trouble to someone. With the implication of dire consequences and probably a weakened state. Another uh, author that, that studies the, the word, and it's an it's a actual Greek dictionary, it means to break into pieces, a broken in heart and body as well. And so this oppression, that's talking about a crushing down. It's talking about a breaking of, of, of hearts and emotions and breaking of bodies even and bringing sickness and disease and all those things. And so Acts 10.38 says this, You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went uh, doing, about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. So whatever oppression that the enemy brings, Jesus Christ came to deliver, to set free, to do good and see people liberated. And one of the um, interesting scriptures, I, I'm not sure where it's at, I'm sorry, I wasn't planning on talking about this specific point, but... So here's Jesus, and the Syrophoenician woman comes to Jesus, and she says, my daughter's demon-possessed. She's struggling, and she's come and, and, and heal her. <clears throat> Isn't that interesting? You, you uses the word heal. Well, it just means come and save her, deliver her. See, that, let's stop there for a minute. The word, the, the word sozo, it, can, it means to deliver physically. If you, if you look at the word in, in the Bible, it means to deliver physically. It means to save spiritually. It means to save as far as healing. What's saving, what's, what's saving from sickness? It means to make something whole, make someone whole. And so then for demons, what is it? It's saving, healing, delivering, setting people free. So anyway... She says, just, just, just do it. She goes, well, Jesus says, this is the children's bread. Can I give the children's bread to dogs? Because she was a Gentile, and in that culture, that's the way they considered them. And so Jesus is saying that. I don't believe he believes that. I think he's just working with this lady. And she goes, you know, even, even the masters give crumbs. And so, but what Jesus said is that, is that healing is the children's bread. And so he's talking about specifically deliverance because that's the context is, is this girl's demon possessed. He says healing or deliverance is the children's bread. And so then she says, oh, yeah, don't they even take the, get the crumbs? And he says, woman, your faith is amazing. It's incredible. I've never seen faith like this even in Israel. And he says, go your way. Your daughter's made well. It's just what he does. See, he brings healing. Because it says he goes about doing good and healing all who are oppressed by the devil. In Isaiah 58, 6, it said, is, is this not the fast that I choose to release the bonds of wickedness, to undo the ropes of the yoke and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Isn't this what I want? He's talking to his people to do this. And that's why I say these things that he, he does, he asks us to do, he sends us to do those very things. And so now he speaks to us and he asks us to bring freedom and deliverance, and healing 
to people. And the fifth thing he does is proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And we know from Scripture that, that he's talking about the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee is an exciting time in the life of Israel because what happens on the year of Jubilee is that if you, if you were a slave, remember the Jewish people could give themselves into what we would call like indentured servanthood where they would say, um, I don't have enough stuff to take care of myself. I don't have enough things to, to help my family, so I'm going to become your slave so that I can, can, you can take care of me, and I'll do work for you, but you feed me. You take care of me. And so uh, when, when the year of Jubilee came, there was a setting free of everyone who was a slave. It was just a wiping clean and setting free. Then they also had, like if, if a person fell on hard times and he would maybe sell his land to someone. And so what they would do is they would count the days or the years or however till the next jubilee and they would pay them according to that because on the year of jubilee, the land would go back to the original owner because if you remember... God, when he came into the promised land, he says, I promise to give this to you and your descendants. And so what happens is he didn't want the land to be gobbled up. He didn't want it to be swallowed up like happens around here. You know, he like like, you know, it's happened in North Dakota. You have all these little family farms and stuff. And then you have some guys that stay in and they begin to buy up property. Well, that property never returns to the family. Once it's gone, it's gone. And so we've seen huge portions of all these small farms get gobbled up by the ones that are doing these large things. Not that it's bad, you know, because they're they're buying it. I mean, they're not robbing people. They're not doing it, you know, they're doing it because they want to farm and the other people want to quit. But this idea of the land will never return. Well, that's what's so awesome about the year of Jubilee. Every tribe had a portion of land, every family, every, and this is, was their lands, and they would mark it down, and so it would return to its rightful owner because it was a promise of the Lord. And so that really becomes an interesting thing. And all debts were canceled on the year of Jubilee. You know, if you're saying, oh, man, that's great. I, I'd charge everything up and I'd do go crazy. Well, no, they know Jubilee's coming, so you can't just charge things up, go crazy. Um, but all debts would be canceled, and that's a wonderful thing. And then the land and the people and even the animals would be at rest for a year. They, would, they wouldn't plant the land. God said that he would cause the land to produce two years' worth so that they would be able to um, not do that and not work or not even have their animals work. It was a time of rest. And so when Jesus says, I've come to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, what he's saying is that now is the time. Now, right now is the year of Jubilee. Now is the time where this is, and he says it today, this is fulfilled. He's speaking of of. All that he did, if you, if you read through the Gospels, you see Jesus everywhere he went. He healed the sick. He cleansed lepers. He cast demons out. He preached the Gospel. He did what he said he would do in these verses. And so this really becomes uh, an example for us and what he's called us to do. Now here's where I want to kind of turn this towards us and I want to talk to us because I think this is important as believers you know if we say this is the word of God and I believe the word of God and I believe it's for me I believe it's God revealing himself revealing his covenant revealing his promises and it says all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus. So every promise that we have in this scripture, we need to really believe and contend that these are for us. And I'm talking about in these areas. I'm talking about in the areas of if we have struggles and, and uh, 
a, a, like a bondage in our life or if we have wounds that that we got from, you know, a lot of us carry wounds for years and years and years and continue to carry those things in our heart when the Lord says, I'm the one who heals the brokenhearted. And so there are those that are influenced by, by the demonic. They're oppressed by the enemy. And that's by mental torment. And that's by, you know, uh, just I had a spirit of rage, a spirit of murder in, in my heart because of the way I grew up and those kind of things. And, and I needed that out of my life. I needed the power of Jesus to deliver me from the power of the enemy. And so we have these things if we have sickness or disease. But what happens so easily, I think, is that we can think we're the exception. This is promises. Yeah, I see other people healed, but not, not me. I see other things happening for people, but not me. I, I see these things happening. And so we think that somehow we're the exception, but we're not. And so what's happening is that we are believing um, things that are contrary to the word. And so this is what I want to talk about for just a minute. So we can say this. Well, that's just the way life is. It's just the way life is. It's been that way my whole life. Bad things happen. People mistreat me. Situations are terrible. And we can just say, this is just the way life is. This is just the way things are going to be. I'll always be this way, or I'll always have it. Or we can say we were hurt or wounded, and it was such a, a deep wound that it shaped how we see ourselves, how we think about ourselves. And I'm just, this is just the way it is. I've been wounded. I'm so broken. There's no possible way that I could ever be restored or healed. But then that goes contrary to the word of God, where Jesus Christ is. He says, I heal the brokenhearted. I bind up their wounds. And so when we say these things, it's, I think it's because, um, it's because we feel helpless, is what I believe. So it is what it is. We just say, whatever, whatever. I'm experiencing this. I've tried to get rid of it. It hasn't worked. I guess that's just the way life is. And what happens is that we feel helpless. I can't change it. I've tried. I've asked. But I can't change it. And then we think this. Well, nothing's going to change because I've tried so many times, because I've asked so many times, because I've tried to do this. Nothing will change, and so then I'll always be this way. And so that makes us hopeless. So we feel helpless. We can't change. We feel hopeless. Things will never change because I've tried, and it's not worked before. And then we can say this, too, even in our heart, because I think we know it in our heart. I know Jesus said he would do this, but it's not working. It's not working for me. He'll do it for others, but he won't do it for me. And I think that leaves us in despair. You know, we keep following Jesus because we know in our heart he's the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to the Father except through him. We continue to believe. We continue to follow. But somehow we, we feel this helplessness. And this is just in areas of our life. I'm not talking about our whole lives. This is in areas where we say, I just, I haven't seen this change. I haven't, I haven't got freed from this wound. I haven't got freed from this sickness or this disease. I haven't got freed from, from uh, the oppression that I'm feeling, the torture and the torment that I'm experiencing. And so because of that, we have that helplessness, hopelessness, and despair. But we follow Jesus anyway because we're being faithful and we believe in his covenant and we just keep going, but without expectation, but without the knowledge that he wants to heal us and deliver us because these things, uh, the spirit of helplessness and hopelessness and despair actually come upon our lives and they, they stop us and hinder us from moving ahead and pressing in. 
So what I want to do is I want us, you can participate in this if you desire. How's that sound? Because I never force anybody to do anything. But I'm going to lead us through some, some, uh, some prayers to be set free from helplessness, hopelessness, and despair in any area of our life. If there's any of that in us for anything that the promises of God, because those things stand against the word of God. Word of God says all things are possible with God. It says it in the opposite. Nothing is impossible with God. So you can say it positively or negatively if you want, but it's the same thing. All things are possible. And it even says all things are possible to him who believes, and we believe in his word. It doesn't mean we just make something up and, and say we believe it. We believe his word. That's what it's talking about. That kind of uh, thing where we say believe, that's always based upon the word of God not anything that we make up. We believe what God has said, and we press in, and we do it. And so if you're wanting to do that, if there's an area, um, I just believe that as I'm preaching, the Lord pops stuff up in your mind because uh, sometimes when I say things, obviously if, if you believe you're helpless and hopeless, you say, nah, it doesn't work for me, or you're thinking, well, nah. If you're thinking, nah, no, not going to happen, then you're in this helpless, hopeless, and despair situation because it's contradicting God's word. And so we want to press in to the fullness of what Jesus has, and we want to go after him. So um, I'm just going to lead us through a time of repentance. So if you feel hopelessness in any area, like we were talking about, anything that has to do with the Word of God, uh, helpless, hopeless, or in despair, we're going to repent for believing in that. Then we're going to renounce helplessness because we have a helper. Jesus said, I'm going to go, I'm going to send you a helper. We have the Holy Spirit. We're not helpless. We have a helper. We don't get to do it in our own strength and our own ability, but we get to do it in him. He's our helper. And Jesus, of course, is our helper. And God is our helper, the Father. So we're going we're gonna to renounce. And so renounce means to say, I want nothing more to do with this. I officially separate myself from helplessness, hopelessness, and despair and reject that. And then we're going to ask the Lord to just forgive us and to, to cleanse us from that. And then we're going to stand against a spirit of hopelessness and command the spirit of hopelessness, helplessness, and despair to leave our lives. And we're going to tell them to go. And then I'm going to talk about what we do now because we'll pray and see what the Lord will do. I believe he wants to heal people right here today. I believe that he wants to set people free, even emotionally. And then if there's no release from that, well, I'll talk about that in a moment. So why don't, uh, if you want you to stand with me and let's go through and do this. If you don't feel you want to, then don't. But I'm inviting you to stand against helplessness, hopelessness, and despair. So just repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you to seek your grace, your mercy, and your power in my life. And I want to acknowledge a sin, giving in to a spirit of hopelessness, spirit of helplessness, a spirit of despair. And I choose today to turn away from that and turn to you. 
and I renounce a spirit of helplessness, spirit of hopelessness, and the spirit of despair. And I reject you. I reject any agreement that I have made with you, words that I have spoken, thoughts that I have thought, feelings that I have allowed. I choose today to believe God and press in for his healing and deliverance in my mind, in my body, in my emotions. And today, I choose life. God, I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me from all unbelief, from all helplessness, hopelessness, and despair. And now I speak to you, spirit of hopelessness, I command you in Jesus' name, leave my life. Spirit of helplessness, I command you in Jesus' name to leave my life. Spirit of despair, I command you in Jesus' name to leave my life. Now, spirits, we just break your power right now in the name of Jesus Christ. We break your hold on any portion of our minds, any portions of our bodies, any portion of our emotions. We sever you off by the power of Jesus' name. We reject you with everything that is within us, and we just receive. We receive now the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we receive today, you can repeat after me, Lord, we receive today a spirit of strength, a spirit of power, a spirit of sound mind. We, we receive today your hope that's based on your word, and we receive today expectation that life will be different because of what you've done, that your word is true. I receive your truth, and I say yes to your healing, yes to your salvation, yes to what you want to give. And I just receive your love in Jesus' name. And Lord, I just speak a blessing now of being open and, and ready and, and accepting of what you have for each one of us right now. Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. So what I want to do then, go ahead and sit down for a second, but I'm going to have you respond because I think it's important for us to respond anytime the Lord is having us do something. But I think the thing that we need to do is come to Jesus. Who are the ones getting healed? The ones that were coming to Jesus. I think there's only a couple times where you see Jesus coming up to somebody talking to them. But most of the time, the people were coming to Jesus. They were coming to listen to him. They were coming to be prayed for him. They were coming so that they could just touch. If I could just touch the hem of his garment, then I know I'll be healed. So they were. there were people that were believing and expecting and pressing in, pressing through the crowds. And if you've ever been in a massive crowd, you know how hard it is to move through. It's not an easy thing. You have to just keep kind of pushing and moving and wiggling, especially in those cultures that, that they don't have the same bubble that we have. You know what I'm talking about in the bubble? You know, if I come close to you, you'll go, you're in my bubble, man. You're in my space. Some, some don't have that. Yeah, we always laugh about this. I was I was at a wedding, and it was from people from Romania. 
And, uh, you know, they were in a communist country for so many years. And so these little old ladies, when they stand in line, what they would do is they would push right next to you so that there's no space because they didn't want someone cutting in line or standing in between. And they would just do that. So we were going and I was trying to get my food. And this there, there was a group of ladies behind me. And this lady just came right up to me and just pushed her stomach you know she had a big old stomach but she pushed it right up underneath my you know on my rear end and I'm going Suzette Suzette and every time I moved she just she was like glue she and 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 it was just that's what it was they were just so used to doing that and and she would just you know and so if you get these cultures where space isn't an issue man you gotta you got to press through and come to Jesus to truly come and press in if I can just touch the hem of his garment. And so I think what, what happens is that every promise of God is, is for us. I, I truly believe that. But a lot of times we just don't press in. We don't press in to get them. And we don't come to Jesus. And we are we come in... in Here's one way that I think we come to Jesus that's not effective. It can it can help in like emergencies and things like that. But when we when we come to Jesus and just go, "Oh, please, oh please, help me, help me, help me," instead of responding to him in faith and coming and said, "Lord, this is what your word says. I'm coming on the basis of this. I have faith in you. I'm trusting you. I'm believing you." Do you know cuz when sometimes when we're just saying, "Oh God, help, help, help. Take this away. I don't want it." It's cuz we're uncomfortable. It's not really that we have faith and that God responds to faith. Faith is the is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We get change in our life as we believe based on the word of God and press in. And so that's why when we come to Jesus, we need to press in just like that lady. If I can just get through this crowd, if I can just push through them, if I can just get close enough, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. She had an expectation. She had a faith. She had to push through. And sometimes we do. I, I, I'm i not sure how that works. I don't get it, right? I don't get it. Sometimes I'll pray one time, bam, and it just happens. Amazing. Other times I have to press in. Other times I have to keep moving towards the Lord, keep praying and keep, you know, it says Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. The idea is that we we persevere until we see the truth of what God says in our lives. So sometimes we can pray once for healing and it's done. Sometimes we have to we have to pray multiple times. But if we keep pressing in, I believe we can have the fullness of what He says. If I can just touch the hem of His garment, so she pressed in. And so here's the other thing that I think, too, is that God's gifted people to minister to people. All of us can minister to anyone, but some are just gifted. Some have the ability to do it, and, and God just works through them at a, at a great way. So what I encourage you to do, that if, if you uh, press in for things, and you press in and you don't see it, is that you seek help from someone who knows what in the world they're doing, and you get the help that you can. In other words, take the initiative. Helplessness, just you just sit there. I can't do anything. What can I do? Hopelessness. Even if I do get up and do something, nothing's going to happen. And so then in despair, we just stay where we're at. And I believe God wants us to walk in freedom. That's what Jesus came for. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. It was he came to speak release to the captives and to set free those who are oppressed. So what I'd like to do is why don't we just stand one more time 
And I guess if you're at home, you can stand too. I know many times I've responded to the Lord and done things in my living room. When I accepted Christ, I knelt down in my living room and I accepted him and I believed in him because I was watching an evangelist on TV. Do what we do. You respond to the Lord. If he's calling you, if he has something in your heart or mind that, that God's spoken to you, I just want you to step out and come forward. We're not going to ask you what it is. We're not going to do any of those things because we're going to just allow him to do whatever work he wants to do. And that what you're doing is when you're stepping out, it's not, oh, I'm going to respond to Terry and he'll feel real good if I come up. It's I want to come to Jesus. I want to step out. I want to come and touch the hem. And I, I just want to respond to him because I know that many times taking that step is an act of faith that says, Lord, I'm trusting you and I'm believing you. And so if the Lord's speaking to you, I just want you to come and we'll pray a quick prayer here and, and then see what the Lord will do. Yep, come, come, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Well, Lord, we just speak the name of Jesus Christ right now. We proclaim your glory, your power, your majesty, your goodness toward those who've responded to you. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we just break off anything of the enemy that's holding or hindering in Jesus' name. We speak life. I speak life to your body in the name of Jesus. I speak life to your mind, your thought processes, everything that goes on inside your brain, that it would line up with the name of Jesus, that there would be breaking of any patterns of, of uh, the enemy that speak to your mind. We just break those off. In the name of Jesus, we just speak your healing and your delivering power to come and to touch in the name of the Lord. And Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness and your kindness. We just speak healing right now to bodies. We speak whatever's going on physically that's hindering their bodies, that you bring healing in the name of Jesus, that you would just by your glory touch them right now. Lord, they've responded to you. They're coming to you in faith. Meet them and free them and touch them by the power of your name and let your name be exalted within their very beings right now in Jesus' strong and powerful name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Just do your work, Lord. Do your work. Now, I just quickly want to give anyone an opportunity that has never come to Jesus, never come to Christ and said, you're my Lord. Jesus Christ came. He walked on this earth. He lived a sinless life. He went to the cross. He was crucified. He shed his blood so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have a relationship with God. Because sin, the Bible says, separates us from God. But Jesus brought about a ministry of reconciliation where through his death and resurrection, he allows us to be born again. That means come alive spiritually. He gives us the right to become sons or daughters of God. He gives us the right to come in and have access into the throne room of God. And Jesus gives us cleansing and freedom and liberty and so I just want to encourage you that if you've never responded to Christ to make him Lord, that you do that very thing. And you do that by turning from your ways to his ways, giving yourself to him and committing your life to him. And so uh, if you're online and you want to do that today, then what I want to encourage you to do is to contact me. Uh, through Facebook or YouTube or wherever you're listening to this because I want to get a hold of you. And if you're here today and want to respond to Jesus, I encourage you to do that very thing. Give your life to him. 
It's the most important thing you'll ever do. And, uh, and I'd like you to tell me that also. So thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We just speak your name and your delivering power over each and every one of us. Amen.